next topic, which is a very relevant topic uh, for audits in ICU, often an imbroglio for the intens intensivists themselves, uh, you know, left mainly to the uh, quality manager to do. Uh, therefore, uh, the audits in ICU for better management, CPR audits, mortality audit using SMR, uh, which uh, the earlier speaker has already alluded to, is uh, uh, extremely relevant. And who better to talk about it than Dr. Benila Chako, uh, who is a professor of medical ICU and deputy director quality at CMC uh, College Medical College, Bellore. She is a critical care expert, uh, has a passion for teaching quality and research, is the coordinator for the basic and the care courses with the Chinese University of Hong Kong, is involved in the quality assurance in her department, as well as in the hospital, and is also a uh, research a uh, member with the research committee with ISC, ISCCM. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Dr. Shalini. Thank you, uh, Kaho, for inviting me to give this session on audits in ICU. Um, I still remember taking over quality in the ICU thanks to my boss, uh, Dr. George, who was an earlier speaker. And uh, I was that time wondering what this whole thing about quality and is it possible to do anything in ICU? There's so much of data. And I really thank him for having pushed me into this because I've realized there's so much we can do. And we've been able to improve uh, care in our ICU thanks to the quality uh, initiatives that have been taken. So over the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, I will take you through uh, a short presentation on audits in ICU. Now, this is uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Uh, now, this gentleman, uh, he actually stated that the reality of intensive care is that we are as apt to harm as we are to heal. And uh, as an intensivist, I could say that this is just a surgeon talking. And what does he know about intensive care? But uh, I would agree with him uh, on this aspect. And I will tell you why. Um, the ICU atmosphere, as you can see here in this picture, there are heaps of uh, monitoring devices, there are heaps of equipment, um, yeah, you know, infusion pumps, syringe pumps, you've got manpower there, different manpower, different backgrounds, and hence it's far more error prone as compared to other areas in the hospital. And a study from Israel about a decade ago showed that the average ICU patient requires about 178 individual interactions per day, so each patient. And the likelihood of an error happening for every patient in the ICU is about two uh, per day. So that's how uh, significant uh, and important the role of quality control in ICU is. And this interesting paper uh, by uh, Niven et al. actually looked at the trials which were published in ICU. And majority of the trials in ICU have been negative trials. But despite that, if you look at uh, the outcomes in ICU over the past de decade, even in CMC, when I look at our outcomes in ICU, our outcomes have steadily improved. And why is that? I think uh, we all would agree that there's been um, increased focus on uh, quality and, uh, and minimizing errors. That has been one focus of ICU care. And that could be one of the reasons why the outcomes could have improved uh, despite the multiple negative trials. And we're just continuing the same management that was continued many years ago. But even though we know that it's important to deliver consistent quality of care, there is evidence to suggest that this is delivered only about 50% of the time. So uh, given this background, we know that it is important for all of us to identify the areas where we need to improve uh, you know, delivery of care, which are the areas where we can make our delivery of care better. And uh, that is uh, why it is important uh, for quality assurance programs and audits in the ICU. ICU has been described as a specialty without walls. We are a multidisciplinary unit. It's like one big family, not just doctors, you've got nurses, therapists, housekeeping attenders, you know, a lot of people who are involved, clinical pharmacists who are coming in and every ICU team member needs to know what are the goals of the ICU? What are the strengths of the ICU, the weaknesses of the ICU? What are the ICU's expectations and how can we make it better? And that is what this whole book, how do we actually get all this information of our strengths, our weaknesses? All this is actually obtained with the help of audits, which compare our performance, ICU performance with standards, which are available 
from benchmarks and you know uh, standard papers across the world you know like you've got uh, the ISCCM in India you've got uh, international societies in Australia UK US all of them have laid down standards for intensive care practices and comparing this performance of the local ICU with best practices is what we call an audit now audit is a quality improvement process that seeks to improve patient care and what we do is we select aspects of quality and evaluate against explicit criteria. So it's not that you may be auditing the same thing over and over again. You may need to audit different uh, areas of quality um, uh, on a, you know any other year because it depends upon the problems that the ICU is facing. And whenever indicated based on the results of the audit, changes are implemented and further monitoring is done to confirm improvement. And why are we actually doing this? I think the bottom line, and that is what I keep on stressing uh, to all our staff, is we are doing this because we want our patients to get the best care. We want our patients to be safe and get effective, good quality care at all times. It's not just for the patient, also for the ICU team. When we keep doing these quality assurance programs, it ensures teamwork, it improves professionalism and makes them better team players. Also for the hospital, you know, all of us know that ICU has always been spoken about as the area where the costs of care are very, very high. You know, we, the, it has been reported that the cost of ICU care is six times that of the ward. And so it's very important uh, to, for the hospital administration to actually know, is the, are the resources being used efficiently? And that is another reason why audits need to be done. And not to forget, this is an essential tool of quality improvement. Every time NABH or the other quality uh, teams come to inspect the organization, they're always asking for audits. But that should not be the reason why we do audits. I would say the reason why we do audits should be to ensure that our patients get the best care. And the quality in ICU can be broadly uh, looked at in the three areas as described by Donna Bedian, where he looks at the structure, process, and outcomes. I'm not going to go through this because this has been covered uh, to some extent by the previous speaker. So these are the areas where we need to ensure quality in critical care. And the audits that are done are to compare reality with the objectives. So what is there versus what is expected? So if you look at structure, you're looking at quality in design of your ICU, not just structural design, but manpower. It's, it's looking at what you have versus what you need. And how do you know what you need? This is based on international guidelines, national guidelines. And who does these kind of audits to see whether you have the appropriate structure in your ICU in terms of equipment, manpower, uh, design and technology. That is done based on your own internal audits, but it's best done by external experts. So uh, the ISCCM uh, does go and do inspections of hospitals to find out whether they are adequately suited to, uh, uh, to run an ICU and, to, and whether they are safe. So this is best done by experts looking at the quality in design. Looking at the process factors, like is your ICU, are you able to do uh, what you are supposed to do? So what it's comparing what you're doing versus what you should do. And this is uh, based on guidelines, again, guidelines and protocols. And this can be assessed with the help of audits. Now, who runs these audits? I think this should be ICU driven, but in order to make sure that you have an unbiased opinion, it's always better to get someone else to come and do the audit so that they can get an unbiased opinion and we can get a true picture of what is actually happening. The next aspect is to check uh, on outcomes, you know, quality and performance. Uh, what do we actually find versus what we expect? And that's what we talked about, what we heard in the previous speaker, when we're looking at benchmarks and our quality indicators or key performance indicators. That is what uh, also can be assessed. Every single thing where we are looking at our indicators of value, these are all audits, uh, which this, these kind of audits looking at outcomes are generally run by the ICU with the help of necessary team, let's say you're looking at ventilator associated pneumonia, bloodstream infections, you'll be using the hospital infection control committee team to help you with these audits. Um, so this has already been covered, as I said, looking at structure or design factors, best to be done by experts, 
process factors to see whether your ICU is, is conforming with uh, standard procedures. It's generally driven by the ICU team, but it's good to get an external person to audit and outcome parameters generally by the ICU team. But it's important that you don't do just a one-time audit. It's very important that once you present the audit findings to the group, you go back, make changes, and do a repeat audit. That is the most important thing to see whether there's any improvement or any benefit out of the changes that have been executed. So how do you actually decide what to add audit? There are so many areas in ICU where you can audit. Uh, uh, when I'm looking at what we're talking about are the process and outcome parameters. Um, make sure that the team finds the audit topic relevant. They think it will, you know, when you audit this particular uh, uh, problem, it will be relevant to them. It can impact patient care, and it should be something which is measurable. Numbers, not a feeling, but it should be uh, measurable. And uh, these are the standard steps, as all of you will know. You have to select a standard, assess the local practice, compare it with the benchmarks, implement change, and then re-audit again. Now, I'll just take you through some process audits. So this is just to give you some ideas of what ICUs can audit in terms of processes. We all know what are standard expectations of every ICU, um, every ICU in terms of patient care. You could audit, audit patient care, therapy habits. So this is um, an audit which was done and uh, uh, published looking at uh, nationwide surveys of therapy habits and sepsis. And just to show that generally you would want your tidal volumes to be kept between six to eight ml per kilogram. Uh, but what you can see here is 80% of patients had tidal volumes more than eight ml per kilogram. So something simple like that. And then you can look at ways and see, can you actually make a difference? Will it have an impact on patient care? These are things which need to be discussed and decided by the ICU team. The other thing where, so those are standard practices which can, and expectations of every ICU which can be audited. The other thing which can be audited are these errors. Now we all know that errors in ICU are very common, as I mentioned, so many procedures which happen in ICU and there's a chance of errors every day for every patient. And this could be in relation to line handling, medication or prescription or administration errors, equipment related errors, airway errors, maybe alarm failure. These are the different errors. So you need to look at your own ICU. You need to document the errors which are happening. And if you find that there's a particular area which is, uh, uh, which you know, keeps coming up as a constant area which needs improvement, that aspect needs to be audited and studied and find out where is the problem, what is the problem, what changes can be made. Um, so we all know that it is, as I mentioned, it is very important to have a safety net. And one of the safety first steps in the safety net is to make errors visible and error reporting is very important. And you can have either a mandatory reporting system or a voluntary reporting system. This is what we use in our ICU. We've got a near miss or adverse events box. Uh, it's like, a, uh, which is kept and people can just drop in uh, slips of paper into, into it. Uh, and there's also this notebook. So this was put initially because there was a, uh, a concern that people may not be comfortable in writing in a notebook. Uh, but, you know, as time went on, as people realized that these error reporting is not going to be punished and we're just trying to make our processes better, uh, we, we've had more reporting in the notebook and less in this uh, little box, which is here. So once you have repeated errors, you may have to identify those areas and run audits to find out what can you do to decrease those errors, run training programs to decrease the errors, make SOPs based on the audit reports. And then as I mentioned again, you need to re-audit again. And it's very important that this should not be punitive, don't take, you know, it's very important that we work together uh, to improve our ICUs. Uh, that's the only way we can move forward. Looking at outcome audits, the ISCCM has actually got a beautiful um, uh, quality indicators, a key performance indicators. I think this came up way back in 2009. And you can see here that it actually talks about, it's put these benchmarks here. Now, this is based on international data. Now, in your ICU, you may be having less or you may be having more. You may need to change the ben benchmarks. I keep saying that, you know, your benchmarks are good. You can try, you must try and aim to reach the benchmarks. 
it's okay to get below the benchmarks or if you are much higher than the benchmark make a target for yourself that is reasonable okay so these are the benchmarks which have been set by iscm now the standardized mortality ratio uh, my job is made easier uh, because the previous speaker has covered this but just to just to make it a little practical i just put it so it's the observed mortality by the predicted mortality Okay, so if the observed, observed mortality is less than the predicted mortality, it means that the mortality is lower than expected. If it's more than the predicted mortality, mortality is higher than expected. Now, what we use in CMC, we're using the Apache 2. It is a free software which is available. And uh, the within 24 hours of admission to the ICU, we, are, we have a, a, a secretarial person who actually fills in the worst parameter based on these acute physiological parameters and uh, also looks at the age points and chronic health points based on uh, patient comorbidities. And all this is documented. So she fills this in, enters it into the software and uh, the, the software calculates the Apache score and gives a predicted mortality. Now, so she enters this into, so we've got um, uh, a sheet, uh, uh, Excel sheet, where we actually calculate the Apache score and the predicted mortality is put in. So what, how do we actually calculate the standardized mortality rate? So that's the observed mortality. That is the number of patients who have died divided by the ICU admissions, okay? So you may get a, a percentage of, let's say, 30% mortality and your predicted mortality average may work out to let's say 30% and your SMR is one. So it matches the predicted mortality. Uh, but there are a lot of pitfalls with standardized mortality rate. It depends on the choice of the standard population to compare mortality. Now I've talked about Apache 2. Uh, just to give you a little bit of history about Apache 2. Apache 2 is actually a scoring system, but that was come into practice in the 1980s. And that is based on studying the American population. So how relevant is it to our Indian population? And that was in the 1970s. Practices have changed. Mortality may have been higher. So you may get a false sense of security because your SMR is less than one. The other thing is there have been modifications of uh, uh, predictive models, uh, mortality predictive models. So Apache 4 is the latest predictive model. But this, again, it has been studied in the US ICUs. It is far more complex. And uh, what people have found in comparison studies, it is the Apache 3, Apache 2 and the Apache 4 are fairly close in terms of comparison. And so a uh, lot of studies even now to date report Apache 2 and predicted mortality. And as I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, data collection, you're depending on someone who's collecting the data. So if the data is not collected accurately, there can be problems with your interpretation. It is also influenced by ICU admission and discharge practices. Now, if you are an ICU where you want it, you want to show that your SMR is less than one, you may send patients out to the ward to die, or you know you may dharma the patients before that. Actually, dharma is supposed to be counted as death, um, or patients may be discharged to the ward, patients may die in the ward. So it's very important that you, as an intensivist, in order to get a true picture, you should not be looking at in ICU mortality, but count hospital mortality and compare that with the predicted mortality. Advantages are, this is mortality is unambiguous, you know, it's, uh, you either die, you, there's no doubt as to whether you're dead or not. It's easy to calculate the criteria, you know, for uh, Apache are fairly objective, they know subjective criteria, and you can map the performance of the ICU over time. It's very important for ICUs to do mortality audits. Now, uh, to be very honest, the past one and a half years with COVID, um, it's been exhausting trying to do audits in ICU, uh, and uh, and we we've not been able to because of the workload that we've had. But it's a good thing to do, do mortality audits because you may identify reasons other than patient problems. It may be ICU related problems which is resulting in mortality, and you may actually find out areas which you need to improve to which can actually impact patient outcomes. So it's very important for every ICU to audit the mortality and see what could have been done better. Uh, this is what we do in CMC. So we actually look at, uh, keep this, we've got a, a whiteboard where we actually look at the admissions uh, based on wherever, whichever month we're having the quality meeting. We have uh, try and have at least monthly or twice monthly, uh, once a month or twice, once in two months quality meeting where we compare the, uh, the admissions of the previous year with the current year. We look at the mortalities. 
So you can see here our SMRs are really, really low. It could be because we are, uh, you know, we're comparing with outdated data, Apache 2, 1976. But if you look here, we can see a trend. You can follow the trend. And if you see that the trend is going up, you need to, you know, go back and look at your data, look at your uh, patients who have died and study. And if you see here at this point of time, there's one place where the SMR is actually 1.31. This definitely needs to be audited. So these are things that we do in our ICU, compare the current year with the previous year, uh, the current month with the previous month and decide uh, how to go about audits. So what do you do if your outcomes are way off the benchmarks? If it's higher, you need to decide how can things be made better? And this information can be got from audits. Uh, once the audit report is given, uh, you must try and change practices and re-audit. If your outcomes are lower than the benchmarks, that means it is much better than the benchmarks, that's good. Uh, but make sure that your data correction is done accurately and aim bigger, try and get it down even further. Um, so, but how many audits should you do? Um, I would say that it's important not to overdo it. People can get exhausted by the numerous audits that are done. And then finally, no changes happen. It's very important to make small steps, not to make large steps, you know, very important so that that's the only way change can happen. And very important that you do audits that are relevant to the team. It should be something which interests them, something which they think it's important. And that is the only way change can happen and, uh, and patient care can be improved. Now, quality is expensive. Uh, there is a balance between quality and cost. But in the long term, I believe that improved quality improves patient outcomes and saves costs, uh, as opposed to poor quality, which comes with increased costs and worse outcome. It's very important that we focus on the low hanging fruit. So, you know, something which is easy uh, to target, something which can be corrected. And don't, you don't have to invest so much money into uh, changing practices. Uh, so, but it's important that we focus on simple things, let's say even hand hygiene or uh, to decrease infections, because these are the things which actually cost money, the infections which happen to the patients in the ICU. So in conclusion, what I would like to say is setting up an ICU and, you know, getting a new structure, new ICU, this is a new ICU which has come up in CMC and getting fancy gadgets, that is only the start of the process. Quality assurance is um, a work in progress. It is very important not to stop with just this, very important to have constant quality assurance programs, do audits which are relevant and all areas need to be audited. You can choose, area, choose the structure gets audited anyway by experts, process parameters and outcome parameters or your key performance indicators need to be audited. Choose relevant topics which make a difference to the team and the feedback loop must be closed. Go back and re-audit once the changes have been implemented. Uh, so I'd stop here. I'd like to thank Kaho for giving me this opportunity to share some of our experiences with you all. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chako. That was an excellent presentation. Uh, very heartfelt and uh, a lot of facts and a lot of learnings that we've gotten from CMC Velour on your work as well. Uh, thank you so much.